Hey, what's up guys, and welcome to another RL Craft video. RL Craft 2.9 has been released publicly, and public opinion is that the mod pack is considerably harder than it was before. After extensive testing, I can firmly say that yes, RL Craft 2.9 truly is harder than it was before, but it's not harder in the way that some might think. Regardless, in this video, I will explain to you some things that you can do to make your adventure in RL Craft 2.9 much smoother, more fun, and detail some endgame things that you can do to make yourself virtually unstoppable and far Far more overpowered than you could be in the previous versions of RLCraft. I would recommend watching the entire video rather than just skipping to the end of the endgame section as I kind of build up tips throughout the video leading up to the final crazy stuff, but obviously you can do whatever you want. Before I start, a quick disclaimer. I will not be mentioning everything new in RLCraft 2.9 in this video as the video would be many hours long, so I will just talk about many new things that you can do that I find incredibly useful and some tips that honestly are really overpowered. Without further ado, let's get right into the video. You can go the normal survival route and find gravel and progress the basic way with flint tools, or you can explore and try to find a structure with a crafting table since those are fairly common. Or you can do what I recommend most in RLCraft 2.9, and that is tactical suicide to get a better spawn. As long as you're not on hardcore mode, obviously. You see, prior to RLCraft 2.9, getting overpowered was very straightforward. Even with a trash spawn, you could acquire steak, joust meat, cooked chicken, and our bones from many sources a lot of the time and then you could just use those resources to tame an Epian, Rock, or Raikou flying mount on night one fairly easily. With that flying mount, you could then just explore forever and find all the structures and materials you could ever need with ease. In RLCraft 2.9, though, taming these creatures is much more difficult and time-consuming, so they should no longer be your first priority. If anything, you should just completely ignore getting one of these mounts until late mid-game. You really don't need them, and a lot of players get distracted trying to go for them. You'll see what I mean throughout the video. Your priority now, by far from my experience, is finding villages. When you find a village, you can place all your stuff in a chest, sleep in the bed at night, break the bed in the morning, which in turn breaks your spawn, and then keep tactically suiciding throughout the day until you death spawn inside or around another village. You will then loot the village until it becomes nighttime, place all useful stuff in a chest, preferably near the waystone for easy access, and then tactical suicide again. If you rinse and repeat this process, you will have a lot of amazing resources in literally no time at all. This method will help you get through the grueling early game much faster, but keep in mind that the early game can be pretty fun and exciting in RLCraft since everything is so dangerous, so you don't have to do this, but if you want to get strong fast, it is a very good strategy. Either way, like I've said already, in 2.8.2 RLCraft and prior, doing this is a waste of time since you can find villages so easily while on a flying mount that you can get within 10 minutes of playing the game. Without that mount, our goals are still the same though. Villages for villagers and finding resources and useful materials. The things that you're going to want to do is kill sheep, pick up mushrooms, pick up wild berries from wild berry bushes by right-clicking them, harvest vineyards and found villages by right-clicking the grapes, taking all the wool in villages, taking vines with shears when you find some, and cutting down all the birch trees you find. Now, let me explain why you want to do this. Cooked mutton from sheep can be used for imp treats, and having a couple tamed afrits early on is incredibly useful. And from testing, you only need 20 imp treats to get knowledge rank 2 of an imp in order to tame it, and the rest is straightforward. If you'd want to know where to get a lot of bones, you can either get lucky and find a lot in certain structures like a crater base, or you can get them passively by defeating skeletons or mini lycanite creatures early on. Making a soul stone does now require 8 in magic, but you already need to level magic to 12 to use an enchantment table later anyways. And besides, you will be getting so much XP from trading with villagers, you will want to have more things to spend XP on. You can turn the wool you find in villages into string, and then trade that string to fletchers and fishermen villagers. You will also turn the birch wood you obtain from birch trees into paper by placing it into a crafting table like so. If you want to know how to see all the uses for an item, in this case birch wood, hover over the item after searching for it in your search window and press U. This will show you everything that the item can be used for. If you want to know how to acquire or make the item, you can instead press R or click the item for the recipe. Now, the reason you want to pick up mushrooms on your journey early on is so that you can make insect treats. When you find a desert, taming an airpeed is incredibly valuable, as it is one of the strongest land mounts in the game. You can also get the amazing new airpeed drill equipment forge part that was added in RLCraft 2.9 by defeating these airpeeds that I will talk about more in the endgame section of this video. You can also tame an iwig instead, but airpeeds, I find, are a bit better overall. These mounts run very fast on sand, making desert exploration even faster than if you had a flying mount. They also launch a projectile that you can spam by pressing X by default, and this keybind can be changed in your controlled menu. 
This mound can be found incredibly commonly in desert biomes at night. You can soul bind it with a soul stone, and making an insect saddle in RLCraft 2.9 is so incredibly easy compared to many other saddles. You can get vines from so many sources in the wild that it's ludicrous, and to obtain these vines, like I said earlier, you merely cut it down with a pair of shears. The hardest material to acquire for this insect saddle is the Marmix Cheaton, but once you consider how little range these ant light enemies have and how bad their pathing is, you realize they are not very scary. You can even make some decent armor while you're at it that only requires 12 in defense to wear and is closest to diamond armor in strength. With this mount and imps at your disposal, clearing out battle towers and doom-like dungeons becomes even easier than before, and exploration is faster since your air is much faster than you are at the start of your playthrough, and you won't need to drink or eat as much since you're not the one physically walking. Now, I will explain later in the video why you want to pick up wild berries and grapes, so you're just going to have to take my word for now. Pick up every one of these finds, especially the grapes. It is very important for a strat I will explain later that helps you basically break our craft. After trading extensively in villages for XP, I expect you to be in at least full unenchanted iron armor with iron weapons at this point. You may even be in diamond armor if you found a set in a village and traded enough to level your defense to 16. Either way, apart from your armor, for your means of damage you have many choices. Because of the summoning staff no longer being a super OP weapon, you no longer want to aim for it early on. Instead, you want to get a shield and one-handed weapon, as well as a ranged weapon. Ranged weapons are king until the end of endgames in Aralcraft 2.9, so you should get comfortable with them. I highly recommend getting a throwing weapon, such as an iron throwing knife or an iron throwing hatchet early on. Believe it or not, it takes but a single iron ingot for 16 throwing daggers. Yep, I know it doesn't make sense, but bear with me. These iron throwing daggers do as much damage as a base arrow shot and can be picked up over and over again. 16 daggers at 62 durability each. I don't know who balanced this mechanic, but we appreciate you. One iron ingot is equivalent to 992 arrows basically. Unless of course you don't pick up your daggers, which will happen periodically, but don't worry, you can just easily make more. These throwing weapons also double as a melee weapon, and they do even more DPS than rapiers and sabers against most enemies. But the reason why I still recommend rapiers and sabers, despite how bad they've been nerfed damage-wise, is that they still absorb 25% of all damage you take. You should use a saber as a defensive weapon alongside a shield, and then when you want to go on the offensive, you can swap to either your bow if you need long range, or you can swap to your throwing weapon if mid range is all you need. What does balance a throwing weapon to a certain extent is that they can't be thrown incredibly far, and you will damage yourself with them if you throw them while too close to your opponent, as they will bounce off them and hit yourself. But if you're low on arrows, they are an incredible resource, and there are even new enchantments that can be put on these throwing weapons, but I will talk about enchantments a bit later. As for your other options to deal damage, you can choose to go with a pike, as it is the safest melee weapon in the game to use, as it has the passive ability reach 2. This weapon can attack enemies from further away than any other melee weapon, and it has the third highest DPS in the game for a base Spartan weaponry melee weapon. The longsword sits at the top with the most DPS, but it has no other weapon passive, so some can argue halberds that sit in second place for overall DPS are better because of the reach 1 and shield breach passives. Two-handed weapons indeed do considerably more damage per second compared to one-handed weapons now in RLCraft 2.9, but the downside is you can't have anything in your offhand. Even with a vitamins bobble or the onk charm that removes your two-handed weapon mining fatigue in their endgame, two-handed weapons still have an invisible damage nerf that is taken into effect when anything is in your your offhand, and this damage nerf scales with your enchantment, so it is indeed a strong damage nerf. Two-handed weapons are outstandingly great for damage output, but you are made vulnerable in the process because no offhand utility. You can still take advantage of the reach passives though, even with the shield in your offhand, so keep that in mind. At the end of the endgame, you will want to try to get the sentient scythe weapon as it can be used with a shield without losing damage, and has by far the most DPS in the game with an invisible insta-kill effect that can sometimes proc as well as passive damage over time effects, but I will talk about the weapon more in the endgame section of the video. Next up, I will talk about the new grappling hooks and the new dodge mechanic. First, grappling hooks. The webhook launcher is by far the best of them in my opinion as it can fully scale a battle tower in a single hook, but the regular grappling hook is still fine. The controls for these hooks can be found by following the instructions on the hook, in my case shift and alt, and while the controls are a bit strange to get used to for some, they are very easy to use if you give them a chance. They can especially be useful in the early and mid game because if you skip to the second highest floor of a battle tower, you can just break the spawners, wall off the lower floors, and then cheese the loot with hoppers. You want to break the block directly 
directly under the chest at the top of the tower and place a hopper under them. You then want to place a barrel underneath the hopper, as tower golems only get mad if you loot chests, not if you loot barrels. You will need 8 in building to use a carpentry bench to make barrels, but that is no problem at all, considering how much XP you get from battle towers and trading with villagers, etc. This strategy is foolproof, and the golem won't even know you were there. Without flying mounts being super easy to use, I see these as actually being convenient. Now, moving on to your dodge mechanic. You unlock dodging at 4 in agility, and you can change your dodge key to anything you prefer in your controls menu. There is a slight cooldown to your dodge, but it is super convenient for dodging attacks, moving faster when running away, and jumping over large gaps. You get a small invulnerability frame when dodging, but this shouldn't be used too much unless you have plenty of food because dodging does drain your hunger bar slowly but surely. Lastly, before moving on to the mid game, I will talk about surviving the cold and the heat. For the heat, it is still pretty straightforward. You want to have your feet in the water. If it is midsummer and you are in a desert, a cooling coil and being in water is all you need. Placing Aussie liner on your armor is amazing as well, but not easily accessible in the early game. For the cold, you need a 2x2 two two space of lava, so one lava bucket won't cut it anymore, unless you're only in a semi-cold biome. In the middle of winter and in a cold biome, a heating coil next to some lava or next to a 2x2 two two source of lava is all you need. A campfire is sadly not enough anymore though, the cold is very brutal in RL Craft 2.9. For the mid game, you can make potions of cold resistance and potions of heat resistance. These potions are not too difficult to make, and they strongly help you fight the cold elements. Now that you can stack potions up to 8 as well, potions are actually very convenient, and there is a large section about them in the endgame section of the video. Keep in mind though, you do need 8 in magic and 8 in building to use the brewing stand to make potions. Next up, in villages, to make exploration and adventure a bit more convenient, you can find mini crates. These crates are mini shulker boxes and are incredibly convenient. These are another reason why finding villages is super helpful, especially in RLCraft 2.9. Now, I would say though that for the early game, that is about all you need to know. So I'm going to move on to the next and arguably much more important category that is none other than the mid game. Now, you are strong enough to enter confidently into battle towers, but if a blight mob spawns or you drop your guard, your cheeks have a good chance of still being clapped, so you need to be aware of the dangers. Without a flying mount or the ability to simply fish the tower golem off the tower easily, it will seem a bit scary going in. But there is a simple way to get the loot even when under geared, and there is an easy way to even remove the tower golem off the top of the battle tower, as long as you have a switch bow and some chorus arrows. If not though, when you reach the top of the tower, you can just use the hopper trick I showed you in the previous section, or try your luck with a tower golem. In all honesty, they are not that strong. Here's what you can do to help you clear the tower, even with little fighting experience. In a battle tower in particular, standing on top of chests against zombies is foolproof against them, even if one is blighted, but against a blight skeleton, making a tactical retreat with a recall potion, an MLG water bucket, or an ender pearl is usually best. For spiders, they aren't really that much of a problem, as long as you have a bezor bobble equipped that they drop. Since you are undergeared, breaking as many spawners as you can is usually smart. A haste food buff that you can get from cooked Yale meat or a peaks kebab works great for this as spawners are tankier now in RLCraft 2.9. With these food buffs though, you will break them still very fast. I will go much further into food though in a later section. As well as this, if you don't mind the time sink, you can run 100 blocks from a battle tower every once in a while and back to despawn the enemies that are spawning to make your clear of the tower more smooth. You can also do this for blight mobs. Once you reach the top of the battle tower, the tower golem awaits. But if you have some chorus fruit that can be found as drops from some miss enemies and some ender pearls, you can make a switch bow and chorus arrows. You then just need to shoot the tower golem with the chorus arrows a few times until he teleports to the ground where he will stay. If you didn't catch it, Chorus arrows make something you shoot teleport a few blocks laterally, so with some luck the golem will just teleport to the ground. Now after clearing but a single battle tower, you should have plenty of bones so you could at least have a few tamed afrits or an airpeed mount. If you do have these minions, you should armor these pets with armor and head into a nearby doom like dungeon or more battle towers, a roguelike dungeon etc if you need more basic necessities. Either way, clearing doom like dungeons or even just more battle towers will give you incredible XP, and if you have some XP left over from your battle tower and doom like dungeon adventures, you should spend some on iron skin passives for more base character protection, as well as leveling your attack and defense to 16. Once you have leveled these stats, you should level your magic to 12 and your building to 12. 
This will be for enchanting and anvils. Also, just a reminder, you should pick up heart crystal dust and shards that will drop commonly from broken spawners and rare or higher grade enemies that have a small percent chance of appearing from any mob spawn. You will turn these heart parts into heart containers that will raise your base character hearts by one for every heart consumed up to a max of 10, and you'll also use the heart crystal dust for vampire arrows later. If you are over level 30, getting a nice enchanted diamond saber or diamond sword is not a bad idea. I would say a saber is safer and your best bet as it is only a bit less damage than a sword, while the rapier is even less damage, so you don't want to mess with that. To make it as easy to understand as possible, the saber and rapier are hard nerfed in Aralcraft 2.9 because dragons, bosses, other lycanite creatures, and even mini zombie and vanilla enemies are registered as having armor, so the rapier and saber's extra damage passives do not work against much of anything consistently besides the livestock. Still though, having 25% damage reduction can save your life. I also recommend shields, even in the mid game, because shields are a get out of jail free card if enemies do manage to get too close to you. When you block an enemy, it will completely block the attack and knock them back enough for you to retreat. If the shield is weak, it will only block a single attack before being temporarily disarmed, but stronger shields, such as diamond shields, will block a few attacks before being temporarily disarmed. Shields also have a timed block mechanic, so if you time your block within half a second of an enemy hitting you, which is pretty predictable, then you can block their attack for free as long as the shield is strong enough. Lastly, for mid game, what should you be looking for? After getting like Education 3 from the enchantment table and the like, you have XP available, but you're still weak and can't survive in the nether easily. Making certain baubles that were OP before, like the Stone of the Sea, are harder to acquire now, right? What should you do? First and foremost, once you get over the initial hurdles of RLCraft 2.9, like the hurdle where players don't want to accept that they can't just fly off into the sunset on night one on an OP resummonable flying demon mount, and that yes, you can play the game easily without a stone of the sea bobble, then RLCraft 2.9 seems super doable. You can't beat all four final bosses in two hours anymore on a good seed, but you can still go through the same steps. Taming a flying mount can be a goal of yours in the mid game. Witch dungeons aren't too uncommon, and inside you may find a large amount of rabbit's feet. You can also make a rabbit's farm if you so desire. You tame rabbits with carrots, and while holding a carrot, rabbits will be drawn to you and won't run away. Rabbits drop one rabbit's foot with a 10% chance when a player kills them. You can also just hunt rabbits in the wild while holding carrots if you don't feel like breeding them, but breeding them is super fast, just like breeding cows and pigs, etc. You can then use these rabbit's feet to tame a hippogriff, which is a super convenient flying mount. It usually takes four or less rabbit's feet, but if you're unlucky, it will take more. Just drop the feet near a hippogriff for a chance to tame it. You can try to obtain a hippogriff early in your playthrough, but I would say a focused player will end up not needing a hippogriff until the mid game, when now you want to find some simple dungeons and biomes to loot for a bit harder to acquire materials that you need for crafting, like silver, glowstone dust, blaze powder, ender pearls, different animal meats, etc. Around this time in the mid game as well, if you haven't already, you should open up your 2.9 quest menu and turn in any quests you have passively completed. For the most part, you don't need to go out of your way to complete any of these quests, as the rewards are not insane, but you will get free rewards for completing these quests. You can also now start checking bounty boards in villages and outposts to see if there are any desirable trades that you can easily turn in. These things will not make you OP per se, but it can get you emeralds for trading which is nice and other neat miss masks if cosmetics are something you enjoy in your playthroughs. Next in the mid game, you will want to start thinking about baubles and which enchantments you should prioritize. If you find a villager or two who sell strong enchantments like natural blocking or supreme sharpness, then you should fully utilize this. Fighting in the mid game while dangerous is by far the fastest way of getting immediate standard RL craft XP. When you hit level 30, you should go to an enchantment table and enchant your diamond chest plate and helmet for protection 4. You should check for enchantments for your diamond bow, melee weapon, and book as well to see if you have any good enchantments available on any of those. Make sure to have at least 15 unobstructed bookshelves around your enchantment table for max enchantments to appear for yourself. At this point though, I would only recommend not taking protection 4 on your helm or chest plate if you see education 3 or adept for your melee weapon or advanced power or infinity for your bow or book as both of these enchantments would help you quite a bit. The reason you want Education 3 or Adept is because they both give you nearly three times more XP from killing monsters besides blighted ones, and that is absolutely amazing because you need XP for everything. If you don't find those, then do not worry though. Protection 4 for your diamond armor was your goal anyways, and that is because with Protection 4 diamond gear, you are now strong enough to fight dragons even with an unenchanted diamond weapon. Let me explain how you can do this the smoothest. And yes, I consider dragons to be a mid-game objective in RLCraft. 
If you can make or find an enchanted golden apple, then you can take down a single dragon with ease at this stage in the game, especially if you have ender pearls for engaging and disengaging and or have an exit strategy, as dragons in RL craft do not regenerate HP, but you obviously can heal up and come back later. Recall potions, warp scrolls, or even digging yourself to a safe area ahead of time are all viable exit strategies. If you shoot the dragon with a bow, it will start to fly within a short period of time and it won't land for a while. You can also use this if you have fire resistance and don't want the dragon to fight you on the ground anymore. Once you know how to fight dragons, you will become excited to find them in the mid game as dragon scales can make you some very strong armor. After you get comfortable right before or after getting dragon armor, you should try to clear through four tower dungeons or mega battle towers when you find them, as the XP you get within is incredibly valuable. Without uber gear, if you do enter these dungeons though, you should try to bring some milk to get rid of the perplexity curse that witches in 2.9 RL craft can inflict upon you. Having all your actions reversed for two minutes is very dangerous. You can also bring potions of cure, but that requires you entering the nether to get bone spores, which can be found in certain 2.9 biomes which are rather common, but the nether is basically a large dungeon with dangerous areas so I don't recommend going there until you have either an obsidian skull and great healing abilities, a large stock of fire resistance potions or fire resistance food and decent protection for gear or a dragon's eye etc. You can just wear silver armor as well in these dungeons as it makes you immune to all negative status effects and debuffs, but silver armor has low durability and low stats, so I don't recommend using this armor until the end game when you enter the Lost Cities and have like Unbreaking 4 and Advanced Mending on it, Advanced Protection, etc. I'll explain more later though. During this mid game dungeon grind, you should be picking up every silver ingot, glowing ingot, blaze powder, glowstone, crafting rune, ender pearl, silk powder, emerald, diamond, and dragon heart and bones that you find. You also want to bring some lockpicks for the chests. Anyways, it would take me forever to explain all the uses for all the items I just mentioned, but they're important. The dragon heart in particular can help you make potions of repairing, which will repair your armor for free so you can save your mending enchantment books or anvil XP and the correct materials for later. If you are exploring on your hippogriff and you find a mountain biome or a cold biome, you should hunt windingos until you get a windingo antler and some babecos for their frosty fur in a cold biome, and hunt trolls underground in the mountain biome for their troll hide and troll tusks so you can make a beast saddle and an avian saddle so you can fly on tamed avians and or beasts later. Honestly though, you don't even really need a flying mount as you can just make potions of wings and drink wine to fly forever, but if you want to skip brewing wine and the nether, flying like a night mount can be very convenient and fighting on them is even better in 2.9 RL crafts as you can't damage them directly while on them. Hippogriffs and amphiphyrs if you're in a jungle and have no other choice are nice at first but they are mortal and can't be resummoned so you have to always keep an eye on them and keep them safe. Another simple mid game goal you should think about is fishing. Neptunian's bounty is the most desirable thing to go for as these boxes can give you Neptunian ingots and you need one of these in order to craft the amazing stone of the sea bauble. I mentioned earlier that you don't need this bauble, and that is because you can just eat an explorer's risotto or seashell maki and lapis fish and chips so you can breathe underwater and move at ludicrous speeds while doing it, but again, if you don't want to farm livestock for a long time or utilize the brewing system, you can go for the stone of the sea bauble. There are a lot of paths you can take in RLcraft 2.9 in the mid game specifically, but I for one find fishing tough and annoying, so I usually don't fish until the end game as land dungeons give you everything you could ever need. But the Stone of the Sea Bobble is still amazing to go for. If you pair this bobble with boots with the enchantment underwater strider, then you move so fast that nothing can compete with you in the water. Depth Strider 3 no longer works with the Stone of the Sea in this way, so you must use underwater strider. If you then pair this with an explorer's risotto, well, we will talk about breaking the game in the next section. Next, I'm going to explain the end game. There are plenty of more things you can do in the mid game, but I consider the end game in RL craft to start right around when you get dragon armor, and by this point you should already have that. To some people, this is pretty much where the video starts, the rest was just an introduction. Either way, now I'm going to explain what you can do to truly become overpowered and what you can do to help demolish all enemies in your path with ease. The first thing I will explain is the brewing system. You want to level your farming to 18 so you can use a brewing barrel. Regular grape wine will extend the duration of potion effects by up to 1 minute depending on the wine's quality, and wildberry wine will improve potion effects strength by 1 tier up to tier 3 if applicable. 
Regeneration 2 will become Regeneration 3, for example. If you drink enough wildberry wine and grape wine, you can have Regeneration 3 for 10 minutes. The downside is that you will get inebriation level 3 plus by drinking too much wine, and this will cause you to get nausea. To remove nausea, you can drink an immunalizer, which is made with blaze powder and a quark crystal, or just quickly equip and unequip silver armor if you have a set in like your ender chest, for example. You can then keep drinking wine with no problem. If you continue to drink regular wine, your immunalization effects, along with your potion buffs, will get longer and longer. When you get the Forbidden Fruit Bobble from killing husks in the desert or from rare dungeon loot, you will no longer need the Immunalizer or Silver Armor to abuse this system though. The best use for this is when creating Potions of Flight or Potions of Dragon Transformation. To make a Potion of Flight, you need to find a Flower Forest biome and to kill the little pixies that spawn there. You will use the pixie dust that they drop for Potions of Flight. You will need bone spores from the nether to make the thick potion though. Remember, you don't actually need to fight anything in the nether, you can play it very slow if you want. Now, to use the brewing system, you must make the brewing barrel, which does require colored wood in the recipe for some reason, and then you must also gather your berries. 32 grapes or wild berries will get you 8 bottles of their correlating wine. You can harvest grapes from vineyards in villages, and wild berries can be found in most temperate biomes with ease. Since you've been gathering them passively throughout early and mid game, you should have plenty of them by the time you reach end game. You need a lot more grapes than wild berries though, like I mentioned earlier. Grapes are super important for this system. You will use a crushing tub to turn the berries into juice, and then you can pick up the juice in buckets with no problem. You will then right click your brewing station, place either wild berry juice or grape juice buckets here in the middle, and then on the right you will place bottles for which the wine will be stored in. The wine quality will either be good or bad, and it will take a full in-game day for the wine to finish brewing. When you finally get high quality wine, which I would say is about 0.65 or above should be the goal, 0.75 being the max, then you should put that wine in this left chamber. Now all your new wine will be closer in quality with that wine. Making potions and enhancing their effects can be incredibly strong. All the best potions in my opinion in 2.9 Heraldcraft are as follows. The Potion of Strength. The Potion of Swiftness, the Potion of Regeneration, the Potion of Luck for better loot and drop odds, the Potion of Health Boost, the Potion of Wings, the Potion of Diamond Skin, the Potion of Iron Skin, the Potion of Slow Fall, and the Potion of True Shot. You can stack all of these potions and then just keep drinking wine to have their buffs for pretty much forever. This is one of, if not the most broken mechanics in the game. You only need one of each of these potions and then a lot of wine and a method to remove nausea like I mentioned before and now you have all these effects with no downsides for basically forever. Since there are some incredibly strong food items for the endgame OP unstoppable setup I showed you in the intro, you only need to make potions of diamond skin, potions of wings, potions of true shots, potions of health boost, Potions of Guarding, aka Iron Skin, and Potions of Feather Falling being optional, but I find it useful. You can also drink a Potion of Fairy Transformation or the Potion of Dragon Transformation. The Potion of Fairy Transformation is much easier to make, but the Potion of Dragon Transformation is much stronger, but it requires Dragon Breath to make it, which seems to only be obtainable from the Ender Dragon or Earlcraft 2.9, but perhaps I was just unlucky in the other dungeon locations that it could be found in Earlcraft 2.8 and prior. Either way, I think the Potion of Wings is perfectly fine if you do manage to find that very rare Flower Force biome. Now, these potions effects are very nice, but once you reach the final bosses in Earlcraft, you will notice that this still may not feel like enough to always turn the tide. For example, against the final bosses in Earlcraft that you summon with altars and soul keys, you will notice that, for example, you will be affected by the debuff Decay 2 against Ralvart and the other demons that are attacking you, which will decrease the healing you receive by a lot. Your lifesteal and vampirism on your weapon, as well as regenerative effects on potions, will be nearly made unviable, and fighting in silver armor can seem like a throw even though it would help you be immune to decay. Personally, silver armor is not a throw, but to be as safe as possible, you can counter this decay effect instead by eating a paleo salad. The paleo salad is incredibly overpowered and it is so easy to make. This salad increases all healing received by a substantial amount for one minute. I recommend all players using this food item once they have a means to heal themselves. You could use this salad in previous versions of RLcraft, but I never realized how broken it was until recently. If you have the lifesteal and vampirism enchantments on your weapon, you not only can heal through debuffs like Decay 2, but you heal yourself so much normally that you're pretty much invincible as long as you don't get one shot. You can drink 
drink wine to lengthen the effect of the food, but the food is so easy to make and it lasts one minute, so you will rarely need to. The bosses, such as Ralvart, will dispel these positive effects with certain damage dealing skills though. For Ralvart, his large AoE green flames will debuff a whole bunch of your buffs. Despite this, you can just eat the food in between his flame attacks and now you have nothing to worry about. Another strong food buff to make is Blood Chili. This food gives you a 30 second leech 2 effect. So now every enemy you attack will give you a few hearts back. And yes, this does stack with your vampirism and lifesteal 2 effects on your melee weapon. With a paleo salad, blood chili, a wild berry and grape wine or two on top of your vampirism and lifesteal weapon, let's just say you don't need to worry about your health ever again as long as you keep hitting stuff. Leech 3 plus regeneration 3 and vampirism and lifesteal is just very strong. Next up for OP food items, we have the Seashell Maki. I mentioned this earlier, but this food gives you Swift Swimming 3 for 2 minutes. If you combine this with Underwater Strider and the Stone of the Sea, you basically break the sound barrier and nearly crash your game. A emphasis on nearly though. This is the fastest way to move around on our Relcraft, and I find it absolutely hilarious. You get so much momentum from swimming this way that you leap dozens of blocks into the air when jumping out of water. Just a heads up though, you can die from colliding into things, so use this wisely. Or if you get insanely lucky and get a Stone of inertia null bobble, then you take no kinetic energy or fall damage, and then you can be as reckless as you want to be. If you want to go even further though, you can instead make the Explorer's Risotto, I don't know if I said that right, and I love this food so much. This food is more expensive to make, but it not only gives you swift swimming 3 for 2 minutes, but it also gives you water breathing, speed 4, haste 4, and fall resistance 2. Haste 4 in particular is so amazing because you can now break mob spawners really fast even with low tier pickaxes, and fall resistance 2 is nice so that you don't take as much damage when you leap out of the water and land on land and take fall damage. The speed when swimming can be hard to manage regardless, but if you don't have the stone of the sea bobble then the speed is actually quite manageable, and I honestly recommend this in the end game. And Explorer's Risotto is just a better stone of the sea bobble. If you can't make this food, you can just use a seashell maki and combine that with a potion of water breathing or a lapis fish and chips food. A potato plus a cooked silex meat gives you two whole minutes of water breathing for dirt cheap. If water isn't your thing though and you don't really like messing with those dungeons, don't worry, we have more food items. The mossy pie gives you a strong regeneration to effect for 60 seconds, and this food lets you skip the hassle of alchemy and entering the nether for boon spores. You can just eat this food and it's super easy to make. And when paired with lifesteal, vampirism, a blood chili, a red berry wine, a paleo salad, well, you, you probably know where I'm going with this. You will be unkillable even more than before. But wait, there's more. I will now talk about some amazing defensive foods. You can eat a pale soup that gives you resistance 3 for 1 minute, and it is super easy to make as bebeckos, the source of the food's meat, are very common in icy biomes. Pair this with other food items and you get the idea. If you eat a battle burrito, then you get resistance 3 as well though, so keep that in mind. Another great defensive food for dungeons is the K-Cellian Ramen, I don't know if I said that right, or as some like to call it, Crake Ramen. Eating this simple to make food will give you Repulsion 2 for 60 seconds, and this buff makes all enemies who attack you get knocked back dozens of blocks. So far, in fact, that many enemies will even stop attacking you because they got so far away, they unaggroed. This is super useful for when you don't want to get damaged in a large fight. Not only this, but the ramen makes darklings unable to grab onto you, which makes them pretty easy to deal with. Next up, we have the Bulwark Burger and the Legendary Battle Burrito. The Bulwark Burger will grant you some overshield hearts, and this is really nice for the early game, but in the late game, the Battle Burrito is better. The Battle Burrito gives you Strength 4, which is insanely overpowered, Absorption 4, which gives you 8 overshield hearts, Regeneration 2, which is amazing, and Resistance 3, you know that broken 60% damage reduction buff that might actually be 45% damage reduction, I can't remember if it was changed or not. I started playing in 2.6 RL Croft, all right, it's been a while. This food is pretty tough to make though, as it needs pinky meat and pinkies can be found in the nether, the end, or in some harder dungeons via spawners. But remember, you can make these effects last pretty much forever as long as you keep drinking wine, so you don't really need a whole bunch of food. If you do want a lot of food though, or don't want to mess too much with wine, you can set up passive mob farms. All you need to do is simply lure the mobs to where you want the farm to be with their desired food item. Most likely, Night large mobs breed just like cows with wheat 
and other basic food items. In all honesty, while combining all these crazy effects with wines leads to completely broken combination of results, all you really need to do to feel super OP is a paleo salad, blood chili, and vampirism and lifesteal on your weapon. The battle burrito and stuff are just an added bonus. You should try to focus on getting that first. Through that logic, you should always pick up chupacabra meat, cocoa beans, and kill every Arisaur you see. If you do that, all you're missing are the enchantments, lifesteal, and vampirism on your weapon. Next up, I'm going to transition to some enchantments. I already talked plenty about how amazing lifesteal and vampirism are, but there is a lot more to enchanting than just these two enchantments. Before getting technical, I will explain a straight up RLCraft fact. The fact is, villager trading in RLCraft 2.9 is just as insanely powerful as it was in 2.8.2 RLCraft. You can pretty much ignore all other tips in this video and just trade with villagers all day and all night infinitely. I waited until the endgame section to talk about this though because enchantments are still king in RLCraft 2.9. There are so many cool ways to play now and you no longer really need to rely on enchantments if you take advantage of like the brewing and food systems, but if you do choose to rely on enchantments, you will be just as successful as before. Except for in the Lost Cities dimension. For this dimension, enchantments are still incredibly useful, but you want the enchantments on a set of silver armor. I will elaborate more on that in a bit. But basically, silver armor makes you immune to the crazy debuffs the dimension will give you. Golem armor, however, does still sit proudly at the top of the armor category for most protections, so going for crafting runes in dungeons and desert temples is very smart after all. But in just plain dragon armor with advanced protection on and a max weapon with food and the like, golem, while still the best for protection, is completely unnecessary. Anyways, back to enchanting. Some enchantments have been removed or made into lower tiers, but bows remain practically untouched, with the only meta change being split shot 4 is removed, and multi shot 3 now goes up to multi shot 4. For the melee weapon, all enchantments are the same, except for the longsword, pike, and halberd are much more DPS than the rapier and saber in general. And while difficulties endowment and subject history are gone, and swifter slashes only goes up to 3 instead of 5, everything else remains the same in the meta for enchantments on a melee weapon. You should make a poison stone bobble and put in venom 3 and viper 5 on your weapon alongside supporting enchantments and now you nearly insta kill everything except the final bosses and some of the bulkier lost cities enemies just by spamming left click. Throwing weapons now have entered the meta as well and can perform almost as well as bows but require less enchantments. Crossbows can perform just as well as bows now for single target as a few convenient enchantments for the weapon have been added into the game for our Rollcraft 2.9. A max crossbow looks like this, a maxed bow looks like this, and a max throwing weapon looks like this. You may have noticed that these weapons have Unbreaking 4 on them, not Unbreaking 3, and that is correct. If you have an Ancient Tome enchantment book, you merely need to place the book in your offhand and have the item you want to enchant it with in your main hand. The item in your main hand must already have the correlating enchantment on it, in this case Unbreaking 3. The Ancient Tome will be consumed for no cost besides the book of course, and now the item has Unbreaking 4 on it. There are a few other nice Ancient Tomes, but Unbreaking is probably the one you're going to use the most. Anyways, back to the ranged weapons. The throwing weapon arguably is the strongest overall, as it can be used underwater as long as you have the hydrodynamic enchantment on it and its single target DPS is higher than the bow and the crossbow, but the maxed bow has the best AoE capabilities of the three and is only 40% slower DPS for single target compared to the throwing weapon. The crossbow has about 20% more DPS than the bow for single target and is only a bit worse for in the AoE department, so the crossbow fits nicely in the middle of the two. The bow's AoE ability truly can't be beat though, and if you level your draw speed and arrow speed abilities in your L menu to max, then the bow slightly overtakes even the throwing weapon in DPS. Do keep in mind however that the arrows can potentially cause a bit of lag, so for lower end PCs a throwing weapon or a crossbow is the way to go. Overall, I would say the crossbow is a great jack of all trades while the throwing weapon has the best single target DPS against like a Rahavart, and the bow is the best for just spamming destruction everywhere you go. Although you do lose out in single target DPS with Without leveling stats in your L menu. A great thing about our Elcraft 2.9 though is that the damage cap on the final bosses and mini bosses is now 100 damage, not 50 damage anymore. And even if your weapon hits for more than 100 damage, the damage will still register at the 100 damage mark. Even with this maxed out melee weapon, I can still fight Rahavart, Amagalich, and Asmodeus and see their health bars go down incredibly fast. I, for one, absolutely love this change. After you do get this strong though, with food items and enchantments, you can go for the final bosses, or you can go for the glorious transformation rings and weapons that can be found or acquired in the Lost Cities dimension. A ring of the fairies, a ring of the dragons, a ring of the titans, a ring of the elves, a ring of the phalus, a ring of the goblins, a ring of the dwarves, and a sentient scythe. 
should be your goals. Not all of these items are created equal, but they all can be acquired in the Lost Cities dimension, so they are very valuable items. The way to enter the Lost Cities dimension in RLCraft 2.9 is a bit different than in RLCraft 2.8. You need to place the bed on top of Cincinnacite lanterns instead of emerald blocks that can be made with Cincinnacite that you find in the nether. Also, I don't know if it's called Cincinnacite. I don't care. Usually, you can find the Cincinnacite around the lava pools. The rest is the same, though. You surround the bed with skeleton skulls and right click the bed. This dimension is super dangerous though as the parasites mod does not mess around so do not go in there unless fully prepared you will die. The best way to prepare for this dimension is making a set of silver armor and enchanting a shield with natural blocking and power defense and the like. Silver armor does have less base protection and durability than the endgame armors but with advanced mending unbreaking 4 and advanced protection 4 on it it will protect you quite a bit and when paired with pale soup or a battle burrito for 60 or 45 percent damage reduction i forgot and a natural blocking two shield you will be perfectly fine and sitting almost around the max damage reduction cap of 80 percent anyways you may be asking though why silver armor why not just go for golem or dragon gear well you can but you'll still be affected by the annoying fear effect constantly when taking damage or around certain enemies while in the dimension and when you remove the effect it comes right Right back. This fear effect is unique as the teddy bear bobble that normally makes you immune to fear does not work on it and this fear makes you unable to perform your normal right click actions like eating, drinking, right clicking your magic staff, using your bow, your shield, and many other things. This fear effect disables just so much from your character that you will be really annoyed when fighting in this dimension and it can honestly get you killed. All you can do reliably without silver armor on while in this dimension is just spam left click and loot. Going in with a max set of silver armor and utilizing all the OP stuff I mentioned earlier and more stuff that I'll mention in the upcoming sections makes the Lost Cities Dimension an exciting place though with fun loot hiding around every corner. That cure buff that silver armor provides making you immune to all debuffs is super amazing. I tend to find the transformation rings more often in the larger buildings above ground rather than underground, but you in theory can find them just about anywhere in these buildings and getting the parts for the scythe is just RNG. You need to fight a large amount of enemies in this dimension for a while and just pick up every part you can find basically. Before the scythe though, I will detail the race rings and why you might want them. The Ring of the Titans makes you 300% size, gives you 3x3 three three mining radius, gives you 100% more damage, and doubles your hearts, as well as gives you some movement speed and jump height. The downside is that you lose 50% of your attack speed and you are very large, so fighting in tight spaces can be a hassle. On the upside, this ring is by far the best for fighting the final bosses and enemies in the streets of the Lost Cities Dimension, as these bosses and parasite enemies hit harder than anything else in the game, except for a few Lycanite Dungeon final bosses and Shivaxi himself. So. Having 100 heart containers actually makes you strong enough to face tank these bosses and enemies with little worries, except for Amalgalich. If you didn't know, Amalgalich's damage has been buffed in RLCraft 2.9, just like the other final bosses, but Amalgalich in particular will now insta-kill you even if you're in max protection with a cross necklace, full on dying baubles, broken heart bobble, totem of undying, golem armor, and even has a titan. This boss just does too much damage with his melee attacks. You truly need to keep your distance from this boss. You might be able to tank the rotation with a bunch of totems of undying on your quick bar, but even so, like, what's the point? Timed approaches or using a ranged weapon is your best and safest strat against Malgalich. Next up, the Ring of the Dragons gives you fire resistance and night vision, 25% larger size, the ability to breathe fire by pressing X gives you 25% extra attack damage and health, gives you 50% armor toughness, which is insanely good, and also grants you the ability to fly at great speeds. You use up some mana while flying like this, but the ring gives you a larger mana pool, so it isn't much of an issue. This ring is commonly rated the strongest, and in my opinion, it certainly is the most desired. Next up is the Ring of the Phalus, and this wonderful ring grants the player 50% attack speed, 20% movement speed, 50% swim speed, 60% jump height, 500% base barehanded damage, which isn't still a viable means of damage unless you have a strength 4 buff on, as well as the Wrath Pendant and Poison Stone baubles, which it will talk about a bit later. The Battle Burrito, Poison Stone, and Wrath Pendant mainly carry the damage in this playstyle, but the Phalus ring still carries its weight for about one third of the damage per punch, and last Lastly, 
the bobble gives the player a jump, strength, and speed boost when you consume milk. The downside of this ring is that if you are wearing heavy armor, you will get a slight invisible speed slowdown effect, but it isn't too severe. The Phalus ring alongside the Posen Stone bobble, the Phalus claw, a wrath pendant, menacing and punishing gray bobbles, and a battle burrito buff allows you to deal over 100 damage per punch, and you can obliterate even Rahovart, Amalgalich, and Asmodeus with your bare fists like this, but there are easier ways to melt the final bosses without having to sacrifice some of your defense. Undying quality bobbles do so much more for your character than punishing grade bobbles, especially in RLCraft 2.9. But this is probably still my favorite method of fighting the final bosses if you can pull it off. Next we have the Ring of the Elves. This ring will let you release a power shot with your bow while crouching that will make your arrow deal more than double damage at high investment and when fully charged back. But it costs mana to use and isn't super amazing unless you really insist on always using bows in your playthrough. In that case, this bobble is by far your best option as it does make bows considerably stronger for a few attacks at a time as long as you're crouching. You also get a movement speed and attack speed bonus in force, which is okay, but overall this ring is one of the weaker ones because by the time you reach this point in the game to get this ring, you will have access to much stronger strategies than being solely a bow user. Next, I will skip the Ring of the Fairies and the Ring of the Dwarves as they are exactly the same as before, besides the fact that the Ring of the Fairies now makes you have 75% less hearts when you equip it, so it should really only be used for travel and when you're absolutely certain you won't take damage and don't want to consume a potion of wings. The Ring of the Fairies in 2.9 RL Craft is no longer the same OP item it used to be. If you choose to wear the ring for the infinite flight it provides, you must always be on guard as you can become very squishy as a trade-off. The last ring I will talk about is the Ring of the Goblins. This ring gives the player some minor buffs at the cost of some hearts and damage, but more importantly, you can mount tamed wolves. Fighting on wolves is actually pretty fun, and the wolves are are fairly strong and easy to control and fight on, but overall the ring isn't too strong. If the ring was available in the early game, it would be S tier, but since you get it so late, it is just something fun to look for while on your endgame adventure. Now moving on to the Sentient Scythe, which is the strongest overall weapon in the game because of its insane invisible damage effects. This weapon has an insta-kill ability, with a slight chance to proc on an enemy except for the final bosses, in other words you don't need to put Atomic Deconstructor on it. And when you hit an opponent with a full damage swing, you will do a percentage of their HP as well as leave a damage over time effect that continues to tick for massive damage. Not only this, but this weapon has extra reach and scales incredibly well with your strength buffs and wrath pendant for example, dealing hundreds of damage. You create this weapon with a living scythe that is made with parts that you pick up from enemies in the Lost Cities, some more parts from yellow eye enemies you defeat in the Lost Cities dimension, which are super hard hitting floating enemies that are relatively rare, and undead soul stones that you get in bulk from Amalgalich and that you can also find in Lycanite dungeons. The Living Scythe is really amazing and can out DPS the best Spartan weaponry weapons on its own, but the Sentient Scythe is even stronger. Next up, I will talk about the Wrath Pendant as it is arguably the strongest bobble in the game. Whether you deal a crit hit, which will be very often in combat, especially if you level your random crits in your L menu, you'll be granted the Sinful Buff, which gives a Strength 4 buff that also stacks with the normal Strength 4 buff. This combo allows you to do the most DPS in the game with a melee weapon or even with your fist for that matter. A fun fact is that you can drink wine to keep this buff on your character forever just like your other buffs. Even when removing the Wrath Pendant and equipping the Stone of the Sea Bobble for example you can have this buff. Enchantments in the game are still king to get you this Wrath Pendant which drops from Amalgalich but after that, you don't really even need an enchanted weapon anymore as long as you stay buffed up with potion effects and the wrath pendant. Next up, I'm going to transition into talking about the strongest magic weapons and tools that you can make in Aurelcraft 2.9. This section would be insanely long if I talked about every tool you could make, and I may make a separate video talking about them all, but in short, I will explain the strongest few items that I think are important. The strongest two magic weapons that you can make in the game, which unfortunately still don't count as magic weapons, so even if you're in like full gold and bookworm armor which gives you 150% extra magic damage, it doesn't actually scale with these weapons which is unfortunate. Anyways, these two magic weapons, while their projectiles don't fly straight like the Gamma Sphere Jewel, they do have the highest single target DPS in the game for a magic weapon if you're close to the enemy. The first weapon uses an Argus Tail as the base, a Behemoth Hand as the head, and an Aryx Brain or Aphrit Lung as the jewel. The second weapon has a Wendingo Antler as a base, an Eore Stinger as the pommel, a Behemoth Hand as the head, and an Aryx Brain or Aphrit Lung as the jewel. I don't like this second weapon as much because the Tundra Icy Pool that the weapon spawns, while it does good damage, can also damage yourself easily if you're too close to an enemy, so you need to be wary of that. 
but you can get infinite packed ice with this tool by attacking water. And if you do combine a Wendigo antler and a Lober core in a weapon, you get an infinite source of cobblestone with a tundra effect with Lober's lava effect, which is kind of neat, I guess. With this logic, you can also get stone and obsidian if you have water sources with a lava core, etc. The first weapon I do like more as well because it also casts instability on a target hit by the shaky green orbs that you shoot out with its primary, thanks to the Argus tail base. Instable enemies are easy to run away from and or to kite, and mages tend to want to keep their distance from the things they are attacking. For the most DPS with either of these weapons, you need to press left click and right click in succession one after another, so left click, right click, left click, right click, and so on. To get these equipment forge items, you must defeat the designated mobs that the items say they drop from, and then you need to level them up in an equipment infuser to level 3 so that they can give your tool the strongest effects and damage. To level these weapons, you will need the correct charges. If a tool says it is the element of chaos, that means that you need to put chaos charges into the slot of the equipment infuser. If you put enough of the charges into your tool part, it will level up to the next level up to the max level of 3. Now, for the strongest tools in the game, you mainly want to use these for mining and breaking blocks in general, as that is their best function. I suppose you can use a tool with a sprig and heart as a makeshift summoning staff, but considering you need knowledge level 2 to summon anything in RLcraft and the sprig and heart only lets you summon one minute at a time for about 10 seconds, I don't classify it as very strong. The strongest mining tools utilize either the ARP drill, Serpix mandible, Geonot fist, Geonot pike, Vapula crystal, or a combination of them. The strongest shoveling and wood cutting tools utilize the Clink scythe, Epian wing, Reaper claw, and or Remobra wing. And having a tool with a Zephyr blade, Cinder blade, or Quillbeast quill for slicing through cobwebs and mass can also be convenient. Now, my favorite tool to use in 2.9 RL craft that I love, and honestly you can just disregard the previous weapons that I listed. I only mentioned them because I know some people want to do a little bit more magic damage, but this tool does incredible magic damage and is such a good tool. I bring it everywhere in the end game and it utilizes the ARP drill as the pike since it shovels and mines super conveniently. But not only that, the ARP drill magic effect on it deals incredible damage that on its own can almost compete with the magic weapons I showed you previously. For the head, I usually use an Astroth Claw for the fast projectiles it files with your secondary. For the pommel, I use an Eore Stinger for also the powerful attack that it fires with your secondary. And for the base, I use the Belf Hand as it will let me set things on fire with my primary. Remember, primary is my left click, secondary is my right click. These supporting parts magic damage dealing capabilities are only slightly less DPS than the previous two magic weapons, and it is easier to aim and use, especially since with this tool you only need a hold down right click and press left click every one second to get max damage potential as you attack with this thing. This is easier than having to press left click and right click in succession over and over again. This weapon is just overall an amazing jack of all trades of a tool that I really like taking with me everywhere I go. But there are still other neat options that you yourself can experiment with in your own playthrough with a combination of some of the parts that I mentioned above in particular. Since now these tools do have durability though, you need to recharge them every once in a while, but fortunately doing so is incredibly easy and simple. All you need to do is make an equipment station, which requires 18 in magic and 18 in building, and then you just need to place in miss items to recharge either their mana or durability of a tool. Simple things to use are bones and iron ingots for a little durability back, and diamonds and emeralds for a lot of durability back, and redstone dust and lapis lazuli for a little mana back, and any charges for a lot of mana back. There are a lot of other items that you can use to recharge and repair these weapons, but those are some of the basic ones that I recommend using. Anyways, let's move on. Also, sorry for only briefly covering the equipment forge section, the video is already getting very long. In the next section, I'm going to cover the Switch Bow. This item is incredibly overpowered and gives you access to game-breaking abilities that can compete with the overpowered food buffs I have mentioned previously in the video. The Switch Bow's technical strength can also compete with the Talisman Crafting Rune items merely via arrows. The Shock Talisman, for example, makes you do a lot of damage to enemies beneath you when you fall from a great height. But TNT arrows literally fire TNT, and you can use this to quickly break wooden and golden locked loot chests because lockpicking on the go can be inconvenient. Now, the Shock Talisman does break steel and iron locks as well when you land on them though, but TNT arrows are much easier to make and use. Besides, the Shock Talisman still can't break diamond locks, so what's the point? 
If you do have a shock talisman and a switch bow though, then you can launch yourself with teleport arrows at a chest and the shock talisman will proc breaking the chest, which is very convenient as long as you don't have too much fall damage protection. But unfortunately in the end game, you're gonna usually have a lot of fall damage protection. Like I mentioned before as well, you can just shoot a tower golem with a chorus arrow to make him teleport to the ground so you can loot his stuff. You can also make burial arrows so you don't have to deal with the blight infernal zombie that just happened to spawn right behind you in broad daylight with a helmet on because RL crap just sometimes be like that. Burial arrows will literally bury smaller enemies under the ground for you. Next up, the vampire arrow. I mentioned it earlier, but this arrow heals you for a few hearts and deals standard arrow damage. More on this in a bit. Next up, torch arrows. They literally fire torches. It's just super cool. And lastly, you can make ender arrows so you can teleport as far as an arrow can shoot, which is incredibly convenient for travel and repositioning in general, especially if you put the range enchantment on your bow. You could grind in the end game for hours for an ender talisman that only teleports you 50 blocks in the direction you're aiming and may eventually break unless you enchant it with advanced mending and unbreaking, or you can just make some arrows. The switch bow can also be enchanted with pull speed that just basically lets your bow fire faster. You can also add some standard bow enchantments like advanced power and room piercing capabilities for example. The most broken thing with this bow though by far is the fact that you can put multi-shot 4 on it. With multi-shot 4 on a switch bow for some reason you shoot three arrows of the type that is highest in your inventory and one of the selected arrow. With this logic if you fire a normal arrow but teleport arrows are highest in your inventory you will fire one arrow and teleport to the three different spots that your other three arrows landed in the distance. In other words, don't have teleport arrows the highest up in your inventory unless you just can't live without chaos in your life. Needless to say, you can get super creative with this and it is a completely broken mechanic. But even without abusing this too much, the combination of these insane switchbow arrows and multi-shot 4 is incredibly powerful. The strongest in my opinion being vampire arrows that I previously mentioned. Even without a paleo salad increasing all healing received, if you hit all the arrows on a target you heal yourself in massive chunks and incredibly fast. If you pair this healing speed with paleo salad you get the strongest instance of healing in the game via a single attack that heals you about two entire rows of hearts with a single vampire arrow. If you only have like so many vampire arrows but you have a multi-shot four switch bow you can just have regular arrows selected but you can keep the vampire arrows at the top of your inventory. You will still get crazy lifesteal effect equivalent to three vampire arrows and all you're going to consume is that first regular arrow conserving your vampire arrows and not actually using them up. Needless to say, I usually just use the bow for teleport arrows and vampire arrows for healing, but you can use it for offense with like triple arrows if you like. If you have triple arrows equipped with a multi-shot 4 bow, you will be basically shooting 12 arrows with a single shot. This bow only has 500 durability and is repaired with Eyes of Ender though, so do keep that in mind. Advanced Mending and Unbreaking 4 works wonders on the bow. You can also use like lightning and TNT arrows with multi-shot 4 to just absolutely wreak havoc on the landscape. I feel bad for multiplayer servers already. A few people abusing this can probably cause a lot of lag. I wouldn't know though as I don't play multiplayer RL craft anymore, but I'm sorry regardless. There are a few more cool things you can do with this bow, such as making infinite torches with multi-shot plus torch arrows, but I will end this bow section on that note. In summary, the switch bow is just super amazing and very broken. With that said though, I'm going to to transition to the final section of this video and that is the very important conclusion. RLCraft 2.9 has so much more stuff than RLCraft 2.8 and prior did and I could be here all day talking about the changes. I didn't even dive into the new structures, the new dungeon and loot pools, the new enemies, the new recipes for certain craftable items and how they get their ingredients or anything else along those lines. I only tried to cover the bare necessities and honestly I still didn't even come close to doing that but I did manage to cover many insane things that I found particularly useful in my own playthrough. Through, and I hope the tips were useful to you all. When all is said and done though, I must emphasize that a lot of the tips that I've told you guys for the previous versions of RLCraft are still valid. You should still reforge your baubles and equipment at equipment forges. You should still trade with librarians and a villager farm can still be nice. You should bind at every waystone you find and you can rename the waystone so that you know what is at that location. Grave scrolls are still amazing since they'll take you right back to where you previously died. Curse of Possession is great so enemies can no longer disarm your weapon and power defense is great as it reflects a lot of damage back to the enemy who attacks your shield while blocking and atlas is still crucial so you can find your way around and let you mark things on it and also it's colorful now you can fill a canteen and purify it with charcoal filters for clean drinking water oh and you can also make an iron canteen and a dragon canteen in rlcraft 2.9 for even more drinking charges the dragon canteen also doesn't ever need to be purified so that's 
super nice. You should make golden carrot juice that can now stack up to eight bottles before you enter the nether. You can sleep with a hammock to skip the day if you just want to find things at night. The new teddy bear bobble will make you immune to fear, which is really nice against specters. You can set up a summoning pedestal and fuel it with redstone for a steady flow of minions for a dragon den or like a night boss raid or just for protection at your base. And honestly, so, so much more stuff. You get the picture. I would be talking all day if I mentioned everything. Either way though, when all is said and done, things are indeed harder than they were before in Unreal Craft 2.9. The early game and mid game will take longer than before to get out of, but once you do reach the end game, there are so many insane things you can do to become overpowered. It is outrageous, and I hope this video helps you on your journeys. I really think RL Craft 2.9 is so much better than it was before. RL Craft is supposed to be a difficult experience. I don't think being able to beat the game within like 10 minutes basically is that fun. Remember, there is no rush, and now that speedrunning in RL Craft is a bit of a pain in the butt, honestly, there should be little reason for you to try to unless you truly enjoy pain. The best tip I can give overall is a summary. If you take nothing out of this video except for a single sentence, take this next one. Make paleo salads and blood chili or vampire arrows with a multi-shot for switch bow for healing. Drink wine if you want to break your game via food or other buff effects and wear maxed silver armor in the Lost Cities dimension so that you can actually play the game while in that dimension. There obviously was so much in the video, but I feel like those few tips are super important for Allcraft 2.9 in particular. When you arrive near the end of your playthrough, fully bedazzled up with rainbow rune, quark, crystal, colored enchantment glow on your armor, and step up to the Asmodeus altar 500 blocks or more from Spawn Island in the end and stare that demon lord of the eyes, you will know that the beast will have more to fear than you do. And when you bring down Osmodius and finally look into Omagalich's dead eyes in the Lost Cities dimension after an incredibly difficult playthrough surrounded by parasite enemies, you'll feel like the ultimate badass that you are. And to be honest, you may lose, <laughs> since those bosses are much harder than they used to be. But if you followed a lot of the tips in this video and believe in yourself, I know you will succeed with style. Have a wonderful day, gamers. Take care of yourselves, and thanks for watching. Bye bye